Welcome everybody. And thank you for joining this webinar. During today's webinar, we will be discussing street art in DC, including wall art, roadway art, art in the right of way, asphalt murals, all sorts of art around DC streets. I'm personally very excited for this webinar and I hope you all are too. Um, first up, I want to introduce you to our wonderful panelists who will be featured on this webinar today. Um, we're having um, one of our panelists is will be joining us, hopefully. Um, she's having some tech issues. So with me right now, I have Kimberly Ibaka and Chelsea ritter Saronin. So I'll go ahead and introduce Kimberly. Kimberly is the Public Space Activation Coordinator in the Neighborhood Planning Branch of the District Department of Transportation. There, she manages the district's streetery program, both temporary and permanent, including developing design guidelines, processing public space permits, and assisting food establishments through district processes. Kimberly also manages the district's open streets program, which temporarily closes roads to cars and opens them to people to safely walk, bike, scoot, play, coordinates public space activation programs and projects, including parklets, parking day, and arts in the right of way. So thank you, Kimberly, for joining us. Next, I'll introduce Chelsea. Chelsea is the CEO and principal artist of Chalk Riot, an all woman owned mural production house specializing in artwork on the ground established in 2013. Their team has created work in over a dozen states and five countries and has been featured in Washington Magazine, PBS NewsHour, The Washington Post and more. As a public advocate for the ground as Canvas, she's been featured a featured speaker at TEDx, the Bloomberg City Lab Conference, and the Smithsonian's Women in Environmental Leadership Conference. She is currently an American delegate to the United States Japan Leadership Program, and most recently has been a Seeds of Peace Artivism Gather Fellow and resident teacher artist at the Kennedy Center's Moon Shoot Studio. Chelsea is currently pursuing a master's in sustainable transportation at the University of Washington, very exciting, so that she may expand the pursuit of public art opportunities that guide us to safer, healthier, and more creatively connected world. And I will go ahead and introduce Nancy, who is our third panelist. Nancy Lyons is the spokeswoman for the DC Department of Public Works and manages the Murals DC program. The Murals DC program is funded by the DC Department of Public Works in cooperation with the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities and serves as a complement to DPW's mission to clean and beautify the nation's capital. Since its pilot in 2007, Murals DC has painted nearly 200 murals in every ward of the city. And while most of the artists are local, the program has worked with artists across the country and around the world, creating some of the most engaging and photographed murals in the region. Since its inception, Mural CC has worked closely with organizations that have provided a wide variety of after school and summer youth programs and has involved more than 200 youth apprentice apprentices and volunteers in the development of mural pro projects. And I'll just add that this webinar is organized by myself, Sarah Hedrick, and my colleague, Michelle Shin. Michelle and I work on Vision Zero, the Vision Zero campaign at the Washington Area Bicyclist Association. The Vision Zero campaign's goal is to eliminate traffic deaths and serious injuries on DC roadways. The mission of WABA is to advocate for a just and sustainable transportation system where walking, biking, and transit are the best ways to get around. Having safe roads is a key part of this mission. And if you have any more questions about WABA, feel free to check out our website at waba.org or shoot us an email. Then lastly, my final piece is for this webinar today, we will be enjoying the three presentations. And then after the presentations are done, we're going to be opening up to the Q&A session. So if you have questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen to enter your question. Um, and with that, I will pass the mic over to Kimberly, who will kick us off. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I'm going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint because I love visuals. So, let's see. Okay. Bring it back. 
switch these. Um, you know what? I'll just do it this way. This is totally fine. Okay. Um, so, as Sarah mentioned, uh, my name is Kim Vaca. I'm a public space activation uh, coordinator for DDOT, and a lot of different programs fall under my portfolio, but the one most relevant to today is the Arts in the Right-of-Way program. Um, this is a really exciting program, pretty new to the district, started back in 2019, uh, and it facilitates art in the right-of-way, as it uh, so succinctly states. Um, basically putting art on our public amenities, which can be bike racks, traffic control boxes, curb extensions, crosswalks, micromobility corrals, which is a very jargony way to say bike and scooter parking. Um, and, you know, we've, we've even expanded beyond this to bridge murals and, and other unique art pieces. Um, but this has added a lot of color and vibrancy um, and highlighted a lot of our safety improvement areas in the district. Um, originally, this started actually in, in DuPont Circle back in 2019 for the rainbow banners that you see in the bottom right hand corner. This was our first attempt at getting um, this formal program started. It actually goes back before that to the um, dragon crosswalk art that you might have seen in Chinatown that was installed many years ago um, and has since been removed because the FHWA or the Federal Highway Association um, has a standard that is called MUTCD or um, basically it is a guide for what is possible in our roadways from a design perspective. And it very clearly prohibited art. Um, you could only basically do like some like stamping that looked like bricks and had to be earth tone colors and cities across the country and the world, as you may have noticed, were putting in art and um, DC, we are have a lot of benefits of being in the nation's capital, but one of the negatives is that FHWA is right in our backyard. And so when we put it in art, there was a lot of issues with that. Um, and we had took us a long time to find uh, kind of our way around those requirements and getting art in public space. And so the Arts of the Right of Way was really began in 2019 with this intersection banner. I put a link to our website here on the slides. Oh, I'm sorry. You're not seeing the right ones. Um, I'm just realizing that now. Let's see. How do I do this? Sorry. <laughs> I normally don't use this, this platform. I want to share my whole screen. I'll just use it this way. That looks good. Kimberly, okay. Just, yeah. Okay. So this is fine now. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. So here's the link to our uh, website. I also have a QR code if you want to scan it that way. Um, but since then, it's been expanded into a wide variety of mediums. Um, there's kind of three different ways that we facilitate art through Arrow. Um, which is what we call Arts in the Right-of-Way program. There's DDOT-initiated projects, which each year we have a very small, meager budget of $100,000 um, to install murals throughout the city. This year is the first time we created a dedicated site selection process for how we select locations. Um, for the, we partner with uh, artists who already have the knowledge and expertise of how to install ground murals, and we uh, put them throughout the city in existing curb extensions. We also have a Color the Curb grant program, which um, artists can apply every year. Um, it's a joint partnership between DDOT, uh, the Commission of Arts and Humanities, and DC Public Schools, where we um, install curb extensions adjacent to elementary schools and then put in ground murals within those new safety areas. Um, artists can apply each fall and then a panel selects them to then work with those schools in the community on a design and then installing that design um, the following summer. It's been really successful. We've um, had a lot of interaction with student groups and really um, is meant to highlight um, and create safe ways for children to walk to school, um, or parents to walk to school, um, but also a way to kind of create vibrant um, communities as well. 
And then we also have privately initiated um, projects so that aren't DDOT funded, that are um, not dependent on agency funding, but things that you all can do as artists or residents or community organizations. And that's kind of what I'm going to highlight today um, to see how you can participate. So um, on our website, you'll see this map of where we've done a lot of our Aero programs for the district. So there should hopefully be one near where you live or work that you can walk to um, to see. But the, the different types of Aero projects include our closed road rain murals, which are those that are in curb extensions or our closed um, slip lanes or other roads that we've closed. Traffic control box art, which is really popular um, amongst bids, typically apply for these where you can wrap these with are usually pretty, pretty ugly utility boxes with some cool artwork. Micro mobility corral ground murals in those bike and scooter parking. Uh, intersection banners, which are those like what you saw on 17th Street and DuPont Circle, historic call box art, and then also barrier art. So there's a wide variety of uh, mediums for you to choose from if you're interested. Um, each have their own unique requirements um, and materials, but they um, hopefully present different opportunity for you if you're interested in, in putting in this work. So I have a few examples throughout the city from a variety of different artists. These are our closed roadway murals and curb extensions. Um, we are very flexible in the type of designs that we uh, allow. Um, basically, very uh, limited requirements. We love to give the artists a lot of flexibility in, you know, being inspired by that neighborhood, that location, um, using their their background, their their knowledge, um, and their own designs to to put in the community as well. And so um, these have been very popular in addition to the traffic control boxes, because they're a wide canvas that have a lot of um, opportunity for people to engage with directly. Um, and unlike a vertical medium, like a mural on the wall, this is on the ground, so you can actually walk on it um, or in it. So the applicants that are eligible are ANCs, bids, and main streets. But if you are not one of those groups, I recommend that you reach out to your respective bid or Main Street or ANC and partner with them to come up with a concept so that they can apply on your behalf. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, I'm here to be a resource and work with you and, and make those connections. Um, but they, those groups would then submit a public space permit to our um, online permitting system called TOPS. And you just need a site plan and installation plan, which shows us what your design concept is and then when and how you plan to install it. Um, I have here the type of design requirements, which basically must be within an area that's already prepared for a mural, which is a curb extension. Um, the art should reflect the culture, spirit, and history of the district in a way that's appropriate for that location, which, you know, is, is kind of a broad interpretation. You can take that in a variety of different ways. Um, no advertisement or copyright protected in, in images because it's public space. Um, and then also no speech because then we get into some safety issues with um, people who'd be driving by this art. Um, another example, which is similar, but just at a much smaller scale, if that maybe seems a little too daunting or large, which are, is our micro mobility corral art. These are in our um, scooter and bike parking areas. Um, again, ANC bids or main streets or individuals in partnership with one of those groups can apply. We have a design guide online which has a set of pre-approved stencils, which basically means that you can apply via email for this rather than going through our permit system. But if you wanna do something unique, like um, these designs over here that the Anacostia bid did, they were the first to use this program, which was fun um, several years ago, then you would go through the public space permit process I outlined before. Um, and we have guides on our website that walk you through how to do that and, um, all the different intricacies of tops. Um, another example is barrier art. These, um, you'll see a lot of our Jersey barriers nowadays around streeteries or outdoor dining areas in the road, um, but there also are public space plazas like this one here that was recently done in Chinatown um, where you can um, apply to put art on barriers. Um, this is also a very easy process. It's an online form that you submit via email to us. You don't have to go through the public space permit system. No restrictions on 
uh, the applicant. So anyone can do this. Um, if it is for a streetery or for connected to a business, we do want you to work with that business or that group. But if it's a public plaza, um, you would work with DDOT directly. Um, and so we can talk about that. But same requirements, no speech, no advertisement. Um, and then you just have to agree to repaint those barriers once they're removed. Um, so this is kind of can be an extension of a ground mural like you're seeing here and add a vertical element to it or just its own kind of unique small canvas area. Um, and, and those are the ones I wanted to highlight most because those are um, the more the easiest ones to kind of do as an individual um, or in partnership with an organization. But we are very open and flexible. If you have other ideas or concepts that you want to see for public art, please email me. Um, I put my email at the end of this presentation and we can chat more about your vision and what you're thinking. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Before um, we move on, we had a request if you could share the map of the, I think it was on your first slide of the color, color the curb and the other arrow projects. Um, and then the participant is wondering if there's any plaques or signs by the designs um, about the process or the theme for the design or anything showing the before or after. Yeah, that's um, something we've struggled with and we haven't really gotten a great way we haven't figured out a great way to do this yet so if you have ideas we'd love to hear it we've experimented with a different few different ways of like qr codes to um you know uh, neighborhood like pop-up signs um, that are very tactical but the way we've kind of gotten around that i'm just going to share my screen again really quickly is let's see so on our website which i linked um You'll see it here, public space activation. This is actually Chelsea on our website. Um, if you go down this map, which is still loading, this is the map that I referenced. So it's on our website um, as well. But if you go and you click on some of these activations, um, let me see if I can get one that will work here. It'll show you the picture and then you can click on that picture. Oh, I have to do this let's see and you should be able to see the background with a video um and you know some of the anything that the artist provided us that they wanted to share we post here on our website for this um so if you have any uh locations that you're interested i'm happy to dig more details too great and I see there's another question in the chat, but I will reserve that one till the end of the sessions. We're going to keep moving through the, the panelist presentations. Um, so next up, we have Chelsea from Chalk Riot. Sure thing. Thanks so much, Kim, for the great presentation. And I will also share my screen here. Okay, we good? Everybody can see? Okay, wonderful. Um, again, thank you for, uh, for inviting me here. Um, I'm stoked to be here in conversation about art on the ground, which is um, one of my favorite topics to discuss and explore and um, is the basis of my entire career and art philosophy. So I um, wear the hat most commonly of CEO and principal artist of Chalk Riot, which is an all women's mural production house that specializes in art on the ground. And we love art on the ground for so many reasons. And we didn't start out, we do lots of, um, we do produce lots of arts in the right of way and have been for the last four-ish years, but we've been around for 10 years and we start, certainly did not start out that way. We started out creating chalk art, um, busking around different areas uh, of all over the world, participating in chalk festivals. And really what started out as a hobby between myself and friends in St. Louis um, quickly became a full-time job. And we found this really beautiful, um, exciting niche to exist within. So um, I'll share a bit of our journey and also just um, how we hope that 
art on the ground can help expand our perspectives of how we participate in our cities. Um, so this is, we saw some photos from Kim's presentation. This was a giant pedestrian plaza and 27 curb extension murals that we created in Chinatown recently. We'll get more into that as well. Here are some photos of our chalk journey throughout the last 10 years. And I share all of these because they all have um, direct connections with the communities that they were created within. So the top left with that person break dancing, um, this was in LA and uh, this was you know, maybe eight or nine years ago. But what I loved about creating chalk art on the ground is that it led to some of the most impactful and memorable conversations that I've ever had. Because when we're creating on the ground, whether it's on the sidewalk or a, um, a parking lot or roadway or crosswalk or plaza, whatever it is, people are somewhat, you know, it's not every day that you see art on the ground. And so people are very inclined to ask, what are you doing and why? And what's that about? And it's kind of, you know, we realize it's a bit of an instant conversation starter and what an interesting and engaging, inspiring way to, um, to participate in the world. And so through that, we've also collaborated with tons of different kinds of artists, musicians, DJs, break dancers, um, fire spinners, you name it. Um, we've, we've, collaborate with so many folks. So that one, it was in LA. Um, the largest photo here was a collaboration in um, the Sunset neighborhood of San Francisco and um, this, China, this Chinatown um, is experiencing and still actively experiencing extreme gentrification. And so we worked with the historical society there um, to help uh, share these stories from longtime Chinatown residents with the general public to make sure that we were those stories were um that we were shedding light on those stories in um an engaging way bottom left is uh, again in san francisco this is a chalk art piece in a skate park which is one of one of our favorite um spots to create in because there's generally no rules you're not really in anybody's way and we usually meet really interesting people um another highlight and positive benefit of creating chalk art on the ground because it's an instant conversation starter is we um, do participate in a lot of progressive political campaigns as well. So this was from a recent, we did so much get out the vote work in 2020. And so that middle um, vote, uh, vote rainbow piece uh, is from those. And then the uh, final photo here is from the COVID days. This was from like April of 2020. And our favorite part about these was while they were little and they were cute and they were small, it brought people a lot of joy. And I know that neighbors met each other and connected with each other over these little um, chalk art drawings, which was um, just so beautiful and so inspiring. The history of chalk art is surprisingly radical and it's one of my favorite stories of art history that I love to share with people. Um, some of the earliest chalk art that we know of, at least in Western art history, is that when cathedrals and basilicas were being built in the 18th and 19th centuries, these spaces were traditionally um, exclusive, specifically for the upper and wealthiest classes of society. Um, and then the muralists that were creating these epic, historical, grandiose murals inside, decided to um, make that art more accessible by creating those images in chalk on the ground outside in the public squares. And this is throughout Western Europe and England. And um, then this tradition continued with people creating um, political cartoons on the sidewalk. And in fact, some of the first, um, if not the first time, at least again in known Western history is um, of policing of public sidewalks in art space was actually against street art, um, chalk art, chalk artists in London in the late 18th century, where um, police started to create barriers saying that any expression of opinion was illegal in those spaces in the form of art. So um, a sort of original form of graffiti. And then the um, photos on the right and left come from the suffragette movement and chalk was a way of organizing 
people to attend mass meetings and underground meetings um, to get folks in the right spot. And it became a, strat a strategic tool that when um, police would wash away these advertisements for these meetings. Um, if you notice the clothing on these people, it's very bulky and there's lots of space to hide chalk. And the chalk was actually passed from sleeve to sleeve from one person to the next as one person was being arrested, they would pass it off and the chalk art would be created fresh all over again. And so that's the history of chalk art. And as a result, um, there has always been a thread of fighting patriarchal norms and one of the reasons why we maintain our commitment to being an all women and gender expansive team today. This is um, a photo from Napa, California, where I used to live. And we started using, um, in response to uh, a consistent ravaging threat of wildfires over several years, we started harvesting natural charcoal from the woods that were burnt and created art from them onto the ground. And so this is a picture from one of those, from two of those events where we're creating chalk art with the natural chalk around us, creating beauty from destruction, if you will. And then these were the very first times that I started to connect these dots between transportation and chalk art and transportation and chalk on the ground, realizing, wow, like there's gotta be more to this. And when I moved to DC and heard about the Arts and the Right Away program, um, I realized that that was like, yes, like all the light bulbs went off and like, yes, this is exactly what cities should be doing. This is so amazing that DC is investing in this. Um, so these are from chalk festivals. And I use the photo on the left from a chalk festival because it's not only a creative use of of roadway space with dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of artists sometimes at these festivals um, using this um, using space that would other by, otherwise be reserved for cars for exploration and for joy and for play. And like, don't we want more of that? And then the picture on the right was from Seattle. And as soon as we finished, a giant bus just like rolled straight through it and it was liberating and hilarious because so much of our joy in, at Chalk Riot is um, the ephemeral nature of our work. But that's when, again, these light bulb moments of connecting, um, connecting transit with art. And we saw this example on uh, Kim's presentation. I, I definitely invite you to check out this wonderful spoken word poem by uh, local artist Mazare. Um, the link is on their website and also on ours at chalkrightart.com and also on hers, I believe. Um, but she created a spoken word poem specifically about the intersection where our artist um, Rosie Sunshine created her own interpretation of that poem onto the road. So this is a multifaceted um, artistic exploration of safety, of pedestrian safety, of driver safety, of awareness of the pedestrian safety crisis, and so forth, and also of the culture and population of that immediate intersection and area. Oh, forget it's, called, it's called three, two, one. I wish we had time to go through it. And these are just more examples of arts in the right-of-way projects that we've done at Chalk Riot. Um, all of these are in partnership with DDOT's Arts in the Right of Way program for which we've been so thankful to participate. And um, this is in downtown Silver Spring. We've repainted this once a year for four years now. It's 400 feet by 12 feet long. So it is um, a giant pedestrian plaza that used to be filled with cars waiting for carry out food and idling and people walking their dogs and walking their strollers were dodging between cars and it was quite awful. And so we give credit to downtown Silver Spring for seeing the vision and, um, and revising the space into a pedestrian only zone. And the businesses along the stretch have only benefited. And here's more and more examples. If you wanna learn more, um, we have all the information on our website. I won't go down those spirals now, but these are the repaints. And then again, this is the Chinatown Park project that we did in October of 2023. And these are some of our core values. I went through them already, but at Chalk Riot, these are the rules that we live by. Um, 
And maybe if folks have any questions about it, we can talk about it after. Um, but we definitely always want to provoke more conversation, more dialogue, more questions. Um, invite, we want to encourage people to view their surroundings from a different perspective. And we adamantly and passionately believe that if we viewed the, the world truly from the grounds perspective, that we would only have deeper understanding of our neighborhood. So we invite you to do the same. If you ever want to get to know a neighborhood, really, I believe that all you have, you know, a, a great introduction to neighborhood is chill on the curb or on a stoop or even on a chair in a streetery or outside on a plaza and just observe in quiet and you'll notice so much. And lastly, we've done a ton of advocacy because we recognize that, um, that there's so much work to be done in improving our infrastructure to protect everyone who uses our roadways and walkways. Um, these are various events that we have brought chalk to the masses with to send messages to um, the district, to the nation, to anybody who passes by and to encourage safe behavior from everyone um, who's participating. And, uh, I do want to highlight that um, the top left and the middle are pieces that were created in memoriam of people that have died in crosswalks. And lastly, our exploration on the ground continues. This was an um, art experiment, if you will, in Jordan as part of a fellowship that I was participating in where we um, kind of, you know, I wanted to get away from the asphalt and away from the urban centers and really explore what does it look like? What can we learn from the ground um, when we're not in traffic? So this was, um, this continues to be something that we explore as we move forward. And shameless plug for the downtown Silver Spring Chalk Fest is this Saturday. Come on out. All the information is on our socials and website. And you can follow us on all the things at Chalk Riot. And that's all I got. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I had no idea about the radical history of chalk art. So I'm really excited to know that now as I walk around the streets and see your work and thinking back of those awesome images of the people in their cloaks hiding the chalk. Um, that's really cool. Yeah, Thank you so much. much. Um, so next up we have Nancy Lyons. Um, Nancy, thank you for joining us. This is just a reminder, Nancy wasn't on in the beginning. Nancy is the spokeswoman for the DC Department of Public Works and manages the Murals DC program. So Nancy, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm gonna pull my presentation in now. So let me know if you can see it. Can everyone see this? Oh, wait a minute, give me a second. Can you see it? Yep, I can see it. Okay. So, um, so again, I'm Nancy Lyons. I am the public information officer for DPW in charge of um, uh, our media uh, relations and getting our messages out, but also in charge since 2007, we've been in charge of the Murals DC program. This is this is actually showing you the, um, when you log into our Murals DC website, muralsdcproject.com, this is part of the first page. Um, we have uh, more than 150 neighbors, uh, murals up in um, 72 neighborhoods. We've worked with over 60 artists um, and through our, with the, in the many different neighborhoods that we've worked in, um, we have impacted um, more than uh, 150,000 residents, probably more than that, but you know. So um, Murals DC is um, a project funded by, it's funded by the Department of Public Works. And um, again, it's been in, we've been doing this since 2007. Um, and first and foremost, it facilitates our graffiti complete, uh, our graffiti cleaning efforts. I mean, as you guys know, the Public Works Agency, our main role is to keep the city clean and keep the uh, keep the corridors revitalized. So this is kind of part and parcel um, to that 
that effort, but we also know that, um, you know, art has impact and we have a holistic approach when um, working with artists and working with property owners in terms of developing murals, in terms of developing the concepts and thinking about concepts. We know that um, not only do they have a huge impact, um, people build relationships with them. And so we keep that in mind um, when we're thinking about um, the development and we're looking for sites um, and we're looking for highly um, visible walls and you know walls that we think are gonna be, are gonna, um, and, and artists who we think the work is gonna make a great impact and working with the community to make sure that we're developing designs that people can really em embrace. So, you know, our approach to murals, we know that, you know, murals are history. A big part of uh, murals, uh, DC projects are murals that, um, that, that um, highlight the history of, of the city, um, that celebrate people who either mean a lot to the Washington DC community or who have lived or spent time in the Washington DC community. This is one of our earlier murals featuring um, Langston Hughes and Alan Locke. It was painted by um, Byron Peck, who I don't believe really paints anymore, but um, he has this really great um, technique and he uses this, um, this sort of uh, powder-based um, paint um, that shipped from uh, Germany or used to. Um, and his murals would last forever. This mural, I believe, unfortunately, is if it's not already been demolished, it's slated to be demolished. And I know this because the community called me and asked me if there was anything that they could do to preserve it, which just really kind of goes to speak to how connected people are to, to the murals. Um, you know, there's really at this point no way that we can necessarily preserve them. If someone dem demolishes a building, you know, there's there's really no way that we can. Some communities um, may do projects on um, like wooden foundations and then they can remove them. But at this point, we don't. So unfortunately, when the building is gone, that mural is gone. And, and sometimes that, and that story is gone. Um, this is another example of um, historic mural. Uh, Frederick Douglass has a strong connection to uh, Washington, D.C. This mural specifically is in Anacostia, and he has a, he has a home in, in uh, Anacostia and a strong relationship to Anacostia. Um, and, and I'm sure there are a whole bunch of Frederick Douglass murals around Washington, D.C. But again, um, oftentimes people want us to commemorate the past. Um, they, they pay tribute, not just to um, historic figures from the past, but um, more recent, um, more local heroes. This is um, a, a photo of Mr. and Mrs. Lee. They were the owners of Lee's Cards and Flower Shop on um, the U Street corridor between um, 10th and 11th Street. One of the first black businesses um, along the U Street corridor, maybe the first black business, um, one of the oldest black businesses in Washington, DC, that that um, establishment is still thriving and still family owned. This is um, a mural on, it, this is our tallest portrait mural at this time. It's located at 14th and U. Um, and it's a tribute to uh, Buck Hill. Um, the mural is called The Whale and Mailman. This was a saxophonist, a jazz saxophonist, who um, played in along the DC court, the um, what was called Black Black Broadway along the 14th and U Corridor. Um, and up until, uh, was living up until several years ago. This was painted in 2019. I believe he passed away two years prior. And so this is a tribute to him. And this was um, our artist working with the community, working with um, a local um Histor uh, historian and a jazz uh, historian to um, consider who we could highlight who would have a connection with the community because you know you, there's tons of tributes to Duke Ellington but there are tons of entertainers and and people who had an impact on the community who are who don't have that same name as a Duke Ellington that we want to make sure that we're highlighting as well and this is uh, 19 this is on um, 14th and U again um, these are more um, jazz greats that played along the um, 14th and U, U Street area. Um, you see Duke Ellington in here, Ella Fitzgerald, Mahalia Jackson. Um, and um, and actually um, also M Michelle and Degas in cello. Uh, in cello. And um, some of these artists actually, um, Ron, oh gosh, which Ron's last name, 
at least three of these three of these artists are actually still still alive, still performing. Two of them live in the Washington area. Um, and I should note that that building was a building where um, Duke Ellington was known to play pool. It used to be it used to be Frank's pool hall. Um, and so again, we wanted to commemorate that site um, with um, something that had a strong connection to history. Um, this is another example of, this is a building that's um, located on S Street. This mural, I believe, because this building is under, under renovation, I don't know if this mural has survived. It was our only uh, monochromatic mural. And um, it paid tribute to the fact that for 50 years, the gentleman in that building had been playing pool. And so that mural was sort of um, sort of a tribute to that club that they that they had. The murals also define communities. They they don't just they don't just tell their stories, but um, you know they they also become a strong part of the um, the they become descriptors and landmarks for the community. This is a mural that was painted um, in 2022 in the Atlas District. Um, and so this mural is, um, I call her Atlas Girl. Um, it was Robert, uh, painted by uh, Alberto Clarencia, who actually lives in Madrid, one of the few um, international artists that we work with. But again, these are murals, you know, you, murals serve as place markers for communities. Another uh, example of um, a place marker, this was a mural that was in Deanwood, which is one of the, which is the oldest black neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Um, this used to be, this was one of my favorite murals um, by uh, Sita S Sadali. Um, it was painted in 2011 in Adams Morgan called Every Day I See Something New. And if you know anything about the Adams Morgan community, you can see um, different parts of, um, different parts of that culture, different um, areas in that mural that speak to things that are, that are a part of that community. Um, Julia's Empanadas used to be um, an eatery there that was that a long time eatery. Um, there's a, a tribute to um, the drummers in Malcolm X Park on the left side. You see a little drummer. So again, ways that um, murals do become um, place markers. WPFW um, was housed there, and you see a little a little um, shout out to to WPFW. Murals make statements. Um, we use murals for messaging a lot. This mural was um, actually sponsored by the. Um, by the DC um, language access program, reminding people how important it is to make sure that we're providing information to our residents who may not speak English as, um, as their first language. Um, um, this, this mural um, makes a different kind of statement. This, it makes more of a social statement. Um, once again, painted by Alberto Clarencia, um, titled Kindred, this mural was basically about people not judging you, um, other people based on what they see. You know, not using so much your eyes to to um, to um, assess a person, but basically, you know, their character, judging them more by their character um, and their actions. Um, this was actually a mural that was painted by um, a local artist, Rose Jaffe, and um, this was painted. It's painted on the side of the um, the homeless shelter at. Um, at 3rd and D Street. And um, as you can see in the corner, it says Homeless Lives Matter. And it's a tribute to Mitch Snyder, who was the um, founder of that um, homeless shelter and a strong um, homeless advocate back in the 80s or early 90s. And then, of course, in 2020, um, we used um, murals as a way for advocacy. Um, during 2020, during the, um, the, in the aftermath of the of the um, riots that um, that um, were sparked by um, many um, um, acts of police brutality uh, during that time period, um, we were asked to do uh, to this was different for us, which, which was doing um, language in the street. But that was something that was an overnight project. Um, it came together in a few hours, and that morning they that was they changed the name of that street to. Um, to um, um, Black Lives Matter way. Um, and that's, you know, as many of you remember, within 24 hours, there were cities um, around the world that began replicating this mural. And so again, um, you know, murals as activism um, is very strong. 
that same that same month we actually that same summer we did a statehood project and we um we painted 51 we put up 51 art projects um 40 i'd say 50 of 49 of 45 of those i'll say 42 of those were actual painted murals um that we painted on about um 15 different surfaces um and then eight of them were actually photography projects um, and basically they were different messages that um, either encompassed DC's um, or advocated for DC statehood um, or were a throwback strand DC statehood was sort of a, a throwback to um, some DC history there. Um, and then also just messages of, of tolerance um, and peace and kindness. Um, and murals were also playful. Um, some of my favorite murals are the ones that to me um, are, you know, either kind of can interact with the community like this one that can still sort of be seen at 8, um, 8 Florida Avenue, right when you get to the, um, the North Carolina line, North, uh, North Capitol Street line. And as you can see, you've got, it's kind of hard to see because you can't see the whole vantage point, but basically they, they're, they're looking like they're kind of sneaking up from the people who are walking, who are, um, you know, walking on the sidewalk going past there. And so you have the you have the the boy out front who's like looking like he's gonna sneak up and the girl behind him, um, you know, telling the guy behind her to keep quiet so they can sneak up on the, the pedestrians as they pass by. And then um, here you have, uh, you know, basically a tin, tin can telephone, you know, the whole concept of can you hear me now, um, but basically with a throwback to, uh, not so much a throwback, but just the whole um, tin can telephone. Um, you can't see the, the other part of the mural, he's actually connected to another, uh, another, um, another uh, portrait, and they're con they're communicating with each other in that way. And then here you have um, Einstein as a graffiti artist, spray painting his theory of relativity. Um, and then we also know that murals people feel very connected to people, you know, or just murals for beauty's sake. Um, this is Maz Paz, a local artist who does a lot of work um, around DC. This mural is in um, the Adams Morgan area. Um, and then of course the famous Ben's Chili Bowl mural, a lot of people for a long time, you know, they, it was a big thing about having your picture taken in front of this, this wall. Ben's Chili Bowl is just a famous place on its own without any murals. This is our second mural on Ben's Chili Bowl. And this pays tribute to people who were either people who icons who were either from DC or influenced by DC. And basically it's the, it's about the people who came up before them and, and, and lit the way for them. It's called the torch and up in the upper right-hand corner, you have um, Harriet Tubman lighting the way for all of the, um, all of the um, ancestors that came behind her. And then you have, and I believe uh, Chelsea, we got, we've got um, the um, Allery which is on 8th Street. It's between 1331 and 1335. This is DC's first. It's an, al it's an alley that is just filled on both sides with murals. Um, there are about 20 to 21 murals in this alley. Um, and again, this is this is was opportunity to provide a space for um, people who are in a highly pedestrian area and to provide a backdrop for them as they're moving back and forth um, through that alley. That's the other side of the alley um, that has a lot of the statehood projects that we did in 2020. And um, that is the end of the presentation. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, again, we just we realized that murals make a huge statement. Um, and while we are cleaning the city, if we can if we can create a statement at the same time, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing opportunity for us. And I'm, I'm proud to have been able to be a part of it. Thank you. Nancy, thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Um, I worked in one of the restaurants that had a mural on it on T Street. And then I know we had a Duke Ellington room in there, but I didn't know it was because he played pool in there. So that's yeah. really, I mean, you find out so much history when you ask what a mural is all about. Right. It's really cool. Thank you so much. Um, so I know we're close to the top of the hour. So I'm just going to prioritize the questions. 
um, that we received in the chat. And we have two questions. They're both in similar veins, so I'm going to combine them. Um, one person said, they used to live near the Silver Spring Plaza. The art installation, installation there is really neat. Um, and they're wondering how long do, this one's for Chelsea, do chalk murals like that last? And how do they stand up to heavy foot traffic? And then in the same vein, Kimberly and Nancy, if you want to add on, someone is wondering how the art, the murals are in the right of way are maintained. Yeah, so um, for the Silver Spring mural, our name can be misleading, but we do create artwork in mediums other than chalk. So that was in paint. We we repaint that with um, with a latex. It's a water-based latex asphalt paint. Um, we use that because we use that paint specifically because we know it's going to be repainted every year. And so if it were not going to be repainted every year, we we would use a more industrial, sturdier um, pavement paint or a coating even. But for Silver Spring, um, it works great. I think that, you know, one year seems to be the sweet spot for a place with so much foot traffic. But again, if we were using a sturdier paint, you can look at three to five years before it really starts to come up in a pedestrian only space. And there's also, you know, there's a ton of skateboarders in that area. There's a ton of bikes, there's um, roller bladers, there's stroller wheels. So it's a lot of wear and tear throughout the year, uh, but one to two years max for that paint. But again, we use it because we know we're gonna repaint it anyways. And yeah, and then for maintenance for, or our ground murals, we actually don't have maintenance plans for them. We view these as very temporary projects that are meant to highlight our tactical installations in the short term. And hopefully then that leads to mid to long term um, upgrades to either concrete or some other green infrastructure that uh, make even a more um, permanent solution to our safety challenges. So. Um, you know, the murals last around three to five years, depending on the installation process and the type of materials that are used. But, um, you know, we, we very much welcome these as being an ever evolving space in our public spaces. And the, the maintenance process for Murals DC, um, believe it or not, um, there are murals that were painted in, in 2007 that are still on display and that still look really good. Um, so, you know, we definitely first and foremost, try to make sure that artists are working with really good, um, supplies, um, certain murals. Um, if people, if, if the owner reaches out to us, if the mural has, um, faded due to sun or started to peel, um, we may go back out and, and paint a mural. Um, this might be maybe after five or six or seven, seven years, uh, moving forward, we typically work in, in concert with the the Commission on Arts and Humanities. And I think going forward, um, they'll be matching funding with us. Our annual funding is 100,000 and I think they're gonna be matching funding. And I think what we're gonna do is, the commission already builds, already has a budget for mural restoration. And so some mural projects came underneath that, but I think moving forward, we'll have a, um, a, a budget within our annual, um, we'll have funding within our annual budget that will go specifically toward um, renovating and, and or painting over some of our projects. Um, a, you know, a big issue, if some of you may have noticed, there are a lot of people who are tagging over murals at this point. And so we're really having to spend more time um, going back out and um, trying to fix some of those murals. So we're going to be putting more money into that. Nancy, actually, we have a perfect follow-up question to that. Um, someone asked, there's murals are being defaced by taggers. Um, are there any programs to engage the artists who are tagging to sort of create a more, you know, so it's not a deface, but more of a creation, perhaps? That is a great question that I have mulled over many times. We've actually had um, panel discussions and invited taggers. Um, so tagging, people who do that and, and bomb other people's work, it's a whole different culture. I mean, I've had this conversation with artists, artists who used to tag 
Um, everyone is not necessarily on board with an organized art program. Not everyone actually appreciates an organized art program. You have people who just feel like um, this is my space. I can paint it whenever I want to. Um, they see a mural and they see an opportunity to put their name on something as well. It's a whole different mindset because, you know, that's what I was thinking. You know, we, let's go in and let's find places for everyone to paint. But for some people, it may be the culture of how they work. It may be the stealth, the stealth, um, the stealthness of the, um, you know, of the, of the operation that might be the draw for them. Um, for some people, it just may be a protest. It may be, um, you know, it just may be their form of, of the way they want to communicate with each other. And mm -hmm. if that's your, your, mo your goal, it's difficult to bring people like that to the table. Um, and I'm always open um, to find a way to make that happen because we've actually had, we've had murals that have been damaged, like the very, like within the same week doesn't happen often but um you know artists talk about this themselves you know they go out and they, they see people tagging over their their work and people spend a lot of money on these projects and people people feel you know people have a relationship with these murals and so when they get tagged um you know they're not just disrespecting the artist they're, they're disrespecting the entire community mm -hmm. but we're still we're still going to keep on figuring out a way to make it work in the meantime you know we do use we, we have artists use um, graffiti coatings, graffiti prevention coatings that makes it easier for um, people to clean their murals that we actually had to use that for the Buck Hill mural. Mm -hmm. um, someone got up on that roof and tagged a small corner of it. Um, and that artist had used a, um, a sealant and the um, owner was able to wash away. Um, you can still see some of the damage, but they were able to wash away a lot of the tagging. And so that's the best thing to do is at this moment is to to um, invest in that type of those types of supplies. Mm -hmm. Thank you for offering that perspective. I'm sure it's a there's a lot to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, so I know we're five minutes over, but since we started late, maybe I'll ask one more final question. Um, and so Chelsea, you mentioned that there's a the street chalk chalk festival this weekend um that's coming up for people but um just opening up more into the future is there events or more installations that people can watch out for uh, um you know after this webinar is over how can they plug into events happening this summer or beyond or installations I so appreciate that question it's definitely peak busy season for us so just this week alone, we have three different projects that we're working on in and out of the studio right here. Um, so the Chalk Festival is this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. in downtown Silver Spring uh, along Ellsworth Drive there in between Georgia and Fenton. So you can't miss it. If you roll up, you'll see tons of artists um, taking over the street with their chalk art and um, we are at capacity for registered squares for um, for for chalk murals, but if you want to bring the fam, bring the kids, there's going to be an open uh, community zone as well. So come on out. Um, we recently installed some really vibrant hopscotches in uh, Crystal City uh, that should be out all summer. We are installing some additional fun. It's like the summer of hopscotches at Chalk Riot. Hilariously, this is a new thing for us, but um, it seems to be trending. Um, we're going to be installing some as well at Union Market uh, tomorrow. Um, and what else? Hill Family Biking is a community organization in Capitol Hill that's advocating for the use of bike buses to get to and from school with their community. I think they're like 300 or 400 cycle is strong at this point and they're advocating for um, some crosswalk banner art in their neighborhood so they have a fundraising campaign going on for that as well if you happen to um, be in that neighborhood or excited about that neighborhood and then Kim can plug all the arts in the right of way projects being installed over the next couple months as well 
Yeah, um, I'm going to do this and then I actually unfortunately have to run. Um, but yes, Color the Curb, we partnered with four elementary schools this year. So those should be installed within the next few months. Um, we also have four locations, five locations, sorry, that are general arrow DDOT initiated um, murals going in throughout the district. Um, maybe more notably is the newly closed space um, just north of Black Lives Matter Plaza that was recently pointed out. Um, we closed it to facilitate bus turns and now we're painting it with a huge mural which is going to be really exciting using one of the artists who did Black Lives Matter Plaza before um, and then you know bid and Main Street initiated projects come up all the time so we are constantly processing permits for those so you can kind of go to any ward please use our map and um, I have big dreams to maybe do like a, a an arrow initiated bike ride sometime in the future so um, yeah Stay tuned, reach out to me. I put my um, my email in the chat. I'm happy to connect. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Kimberly. Murals DC is continuing its um, work in uh, focusing on uh, Ward 8 in Anacostia since it was named the um, Art and Culture District of Washington DC. And so this summer we will be um, working on murals in that area and in September, right in time for Art All Night, we will be installing um, Anacostia's largest uh, largest mural um, featuring local artists as, as well as um, um, world-renowned El Mac, who is from California and who does amazing, amazing work. And so we're really excited about that. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, virtual round of applause for Chelsea, Kimberly, and Nancy. Uh, I just... I'm so excited to go out and walk around again, you know, with this new information, the history of the street art in DC. For our um, participants, for our registrants, we've recorded this so uh, we can send out the recording um, to people who missed it or could only stay for half. And then if there are any links or information like that, we'll send out website and stuff to keep everyone um, plugged in and up to date with the information where they can hear about events from these programs that we've heard about. And with that, I know we're 10 minutes over, so we'll give a big virtual round of applause and um, wrap up the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.